All right, welcome everyone. It's wonderful to see you all here. My name is Alex Minami. I'm the Associate Director of Community Engagement here at Seattle Opera, and it is my very sincere pleasure to welcome you all to Tagney Jones Hall to hear from the creators behind our world premiere production of A Thousand Splendid Sons. Before we do that, however, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are gathered on the ancestral homeland of the Coast Salish peoples. Since time immemorial, the Coast Salish peoples have been stewards of this land and its waterways and continue to shape the Puget Sound region today. We recognize that it is our collective responsibility to honor, preserve, and know the land we are on. So we've reached the culmination of a month-long period of rehearsals, and tomorrow evening, uh, a little over 24 hours from now, we will uh, experience, for the first time, this opera being performed in public. This That performance will mark the culmination of over a decade's worth of effort and planning and anticipation. And I'm very excited for you all to have this opportunity to hear directly from some of the key individuals involved in the creation of this new work. First, I'd like to introduce Sheila Silver, who first... who first conceived of adapting this novel into an opera after hearing it on audiobook in 2009. Sheila is an acclaimed composer of chamber and orchestral music, songs, and opera. With the support of a Guggenheim Fellowship, she traveled to India in 2014 to study Hindustani music with master singer Kedar Bodas in order to incorporate elements of Hindustani music, which forms the basis of the classical music tradition in Afghanistan, into her groundbreaking and unique score for A Thousand Splendid Sons. She worked in partnership with her longtime friend and collaborator, librettist Stephen Kitsakos. who took on the mammoth challenge of distilling the entire novel into the beautiful text that you will hear tomorrow. Stephen also wrote the libretto for Sheila's opera The Wooden Sword in 2009 and the cantata The White Rooster in 2010 for the Smithsonian Institution. Stephen was a professor of theater arts at SUNY uh, New, New Paltz, did I say that correctly? And currently teaches at UCLA Osher Institute and the studios of Key West. I think there, there's some members of that studio here this evening. Conductor Vishwa Subaraman has returned to Seattle Opera for his third time in as many years to lead yet another contemporary work with Seattle Opera. <laughs> You may remember him previously as conductor of our filmed production of Jonathan Dove and April DeAngelis's Flight in 2021, <laughs> as well as the conductor of Janine Tesori and Taswell Thompson's Blue exactly one year ago. You're very popular, Vishwa, here. <laughs> um, uh, Vishwa recently served as the artistic director and music director of the Skylight Music Theater in Milwaukee, where he expanded the comp company's repertoire and placed it at the forefront of the industry in producing contemporary opera and reimagining traditional works. Prior to that, Vishwa was the artistic director and founder of Opera Vista, Houston's innovative contemporary opera company. Our stage director is Roya Sadat. Afghanistan's first woman film and television producer during the post-Taliban era, and the winner of more than 20 international film awards, including the 2020, 2021 Kim Dae Jung Nobel Peace Film Award and the 2018 International Women of Courage Award presented by the US Department of State. Yeah. 
Roya is among the BBC's 100 Inspiring and Influential Women of 2021. Her film, A Letter to the President, was selected as the official entry, entry for Afghanistan for the best foreign language film at the 90th Academy Awards. And lastly, I'd like to introduce our moderator for tonight's talk, Humaira Gilzai. Humaira is a sought-after cultural expert, speaker, and writer with a mission to unveil the beauty, poetry, and humanity of the Afghan people through stories, something you do incredibly well, Humaira. Among her... <laughs> Among her many recent engagements were Seattle Rep's uh, production of Sylvia Curry's uh, play, Selling Cobble, in April of last year, as well as um, her Broadway debut in July of last year with Sp Matthew Spangler's play adaptation of Khaled Hosseini's other celebrated novel, The Kite Runner. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to our panelists, and thank you, Humaira, for leading tonight's conversation. Thank you, Alex. This uh, it was really fun working with Alex on this um, uh, talk tonight. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I wanted to just start out by giving you a little bit of background on our opera, uh, which is, of course, A Thousand Splendid Sons. You've heard a lot about this. It's based on Khalid Hosseini's second novel. Uh, it sold over 120 um, million copies, sorry, 12 million copies. I'm adding an extra zero. I think Khalid would be really happy if there were 120 million copies. Um, uh, around the world, uh, it has been um, distributed in 70 countries. It was also adapted to stage uh, in 2018 and had a theatrical uh, production in um, seven different um, theaters in Northern America. Uh, when I first read the book, um, as an Afghan American, I was just uh, impressed by how Khalid uh, had such a nuanced portrayal of Afghan families, and he encompassed such a large history of Afghanistan. And of course, he really uh, shows the effects of war and the collateral damage, which is mostly women and children. Um, we're all part of the creative team for Seattle Opera's world premiere, and I'm really happy to be here with, tonight with all of you who apparently didn't have anything else to do but to come and hear all about our adaptation. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we've all been working on this um, production very diligently, and we're very proud to present this beautiful opera to you. Um, how, many, how many of you have read the book? If you could just give me a show of hands. Oh, wow. Okay. So there's a, there's a good number of you. Uh, I was going to give you a little overview of the story, but I don't think you really need it. Um, but the one thing that is really important to note is that the story traverses three decades of Afghan history. First, starting from 1959 to 1978, which I dub as Era of Peace. And then the era of war, which starts with the Russian invasion of Afghanistan, and then it ends with the Afghan Civil War. And then, of course, the era of gender apartheid, when the um, Taliban first took over the country and basically cut it off from the world and oppressed women uh, quite extensively. Um, I'm really honored to have such talent and brain power here, and I'm sure you're all really excited to hear from them. Um, I'll start out with Sheila, who's our composer, and I've been really honored to know Sheila and Steven for six years when I work with them on the first workshop, uh, uh, first workshop of Act Two of this play. And it's been quite a journey and learning process for me personally. And I can safely say for the rest of the Afghans involved, because none of us have been very well versed in opera. So we have learned quite a lot in this process. Um, 
So Sheila, tell us a little bit about your um, composing background and also what inspired you to undertake this opera. Is it on? Yeah, it's on, okay. Well, first of all, you have to understand that opera has always been my passion. Even as a very young composer, I was concocting ideas for operas. And I wrote my first opera in the early 80s. And, but it took 20 years for it to get to the stage. And when it finally did get to the stage, the, uh, the uh, video of that and the arias from that won me a, 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 the, my second opera commission, uh, which was The Wooden Sword, which I collaborated with on Steve. And all of that uh, got the attention of Opera America, and I got another grant to start A Thousand Splendid Sons. So opera has been with me, but not um, uh, not the, the focal major focal point of my career up until now. And um, w when I first, um, I'm the kind of person who reads a book and says, "Is this an opera?" I, there's nothing, no book I read that in fiction, even nonfiction, that I don't say, "Is there an opera in this?" And uh, when I first listened to the book on tape of, of this book and I got to the uh, execution scene and I was driving down the highway and the tears were streaming down my face and I said, oh my God, this is so operatic. And, and so it, to me, it was right away was an opera because the emotions are big, the heart is big, <clears throat> the women are such courageous heroines and, and most of my operas tend to be about women anyway. So uh, I was very moved by this. And it was a long, complicated story, and I s sat on it for a couple of years, kept thinking about it, it kept coming back, and finally I said to Steve, you better read this. <laughs> and he read it, and, and we said, okay, we can do this. And that was the beginning of the journey. Well, that's a great segue. Um, it sounds like you and Sheila have done a lot of work together, Stephen. Um, so could you tell us about the call you got from Sheila? about her inspiration to adapt A Thousand Splendid Sons? Um, well, you know, Sheila and I had done the two previous projects, and uh, Sheila is, there's a Yiddish word I have to use, it is called spilkes. And it's basically somebody who has to move around and do lots of things all the time. And oh, Sheila- oh, oh, really? Sheila like has, Sheila this is, is like Sheila. And, full of energy, absolute energy, and was always, what about this, and what about this, and what about this? And she landed on this book, and she, and she said, you need to read it, you need to read it. And so I said, okay, I had read The Kite Runner, and I thought it was just beautifully written, rich, rich with text. Definitely a work, um, not an opera, but definitely a work that could be dramatized. And uh, I picked up the book, and I read it, I think I read it in maybe two, uh, two, uh, two sittings. You know, I read it and then I, maybe I had dinner and then I finished reading it again. And while I didn't have the same experience as Sheila in terms of the driving down and the streaming, I thought, here is a story about a woman, Mariam, who has found love and fulfillment after years, years, of being told she was worthless. And the emotions that generate that type of feeling to me are operatic, because we know in opera, first of all, the words have to make room for the music to tell the story, and the emotions are so heightened, they're so exalted, there's no way to express them other than through song, other than through the human voice. I mean, the gift of singing, the gift of the voice. And so I said, yes, but it's a bitch. <laughs> this is a, a book that takes place over 40 years, almost 40 years in history. It's, it's encircled by politics, socio-political, socio-cultural, but at the core of it is really the story of two women and their husband. And as long as we can find a way to tell that story in a comprehensible way, and respect our audience, because that's the most important thing. Is this going to be clear storytelling to our audience? 
and then let the music tell the story, I said, well, yeah, I'm up for it, so let's do it. Well, you did an amazing job with that. You've Thank you. not well, we'll only... We'll see tomorrow, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm going to first ask this question um, in Farsi, the common language that we have, and then I'll translate, or, or I'll read it in English as well. Um, Roya John, when um, Sheila John started the opera, it was the first time in 2013. It was the time in Afghanistan, and it was the film and television. امکان داره که با ما یک ذره تشریح کنید در باری زیک چطور کار دانه شروع کدین اما اول می ره دگلیسی می کنم باز شما جواب بدین So um, the question to Roy is when Sheila started working on this opera in 2013 you were in Afghanistan and you were starting to work on film and TV shows could you tell us more about your background as a filmmaker? I thank you So I think a little change my chair <laughs> friend um, Actually, yes, in 2013, when Sheila started with music, um, that is usual. This is the first time um, after the libretto, uh, after adaptation from the book, they start with music. That this is totally different movie world because we start with music after during the post-production, after we make movies. And um, sometimes even during the production of our opera, I just thinking, oh my God, if for this, like when we, you build the characters, it's, so, it's first, it's came alive when the writer start with the book. And then second time came with the libretto. And then the third times came with the music. Then came for the uh, director, for the stage direction. So sometimes I was thinking, if I understand before that Sheila started with music, then maybe we had some chats about our characters, about that. Of course, we have very power music. So um, yes, that time I was uh, working, uh, making movies, fiction movies. I have experience with more with fiction movies, with uh, TV drama. And uh, I think it was before COVID. Uh, I received email about the opera from Seattle Opera to work as a stage director, and then we start. Yes, the practically it's about two years. وقتی که شما اولی نیمیل گرفتین از طرف بخیلم چی بود کریستینا چی فکر کردین در بارش یعنی گفتین آپرا چی است یا چی رقم در بارش عکس العمل دادین the question is uh, what was your reaction when you first heard uh, I'm assuming it was an email from Christina, but I don't know. Maybe it was from somebody else. Uh, what was what was her reaction um, to being asked to direct an opera? Yeah, what what will be the opera? Yes, first of all. <laughs> yeah. What is an opera? Or did you watch the opera? <laughs> um, so before I go for this uh, for your question, I just want to uh, talk about the opera or. Um, you know, uh, when I make my first movies, uh, unfortunately it was the 2001, after the first time the Taliban took over the country, and then uh, many cinema theater was uh, destroyed during the civil war, and then when the Taliban came in, they destroyed, like we had very old and historical theater in Herat city, and then they destroyed and they make mosques. So um, when I produce my movies, we just search that we, are, we should uh, give uh, like a screening, premiere for the movie. So I participated with my first movie, the film festival in uh, Germany, in Köln Film Festival. Then I see first time theater, cinema with my first movies. <laughs> and for the opera, uh, uh, Sheila to I think about two, three times she said for me, Roya, let's book ticket, let's go together for to watch opera. And sometimes I was just to like search good opera and go click to book the ticket. But I say no, 
no, please wait and watch your opera in the theater, the first opera. So maybe tomorrow when we see our opera here, when we start the production, it was for me first time that I see opera live in, in, the, in the stage. But I think the most important things between uh, my experience in making movie and opera, uh, always you as, as an artist try to, to tell the story through the best way, the good way, what, what you, um, I mean, you try your best with many elements that you're thinking about, uh, starting from the cast, from um, set designing, from costume, from lighting, from many elements that we have good team also. You try to, to bring out that feeling that the people waiting for that, you know, the people, so this is the most common between movie and opera. And this is the things that you're looking for that feeling. That feeling give for your courage to go ahead. Don't worry about technique. Uh, maybe if you go in wrong way, like in, during the rehearsal, sometimes I had some direction and then uh, our conductor and music director, uh, I really appreciate our team, they had passion to, because was my first experience. And my assistant also, technically, he helped me a lot with the score. With the score, music score is really not, it's difficult. It's need long time to, <laughs> to be in. So anyway, um, a story, book. Um, Layla, Mariam, a story starting from Herod and go to Kabul, like, like you walking all that period, you, you're thinking about all that period and then you love to go. You like I mean I mean besides the experience with movie, maybe these two characters, Lila and Mariam, they give this courage for me to to start with this opera. And of course the, the people, the great people in Seattle Opera that they trust me. Well, I think you're witnessing a lot of firsts here. You know, Sheila's first opera, Steven or, or, or first opera on a grand stage, same My with. First opera on this big stage. Yes, yes. And Stephen's first libretto on such a big stage. Vishwa, I don't know, he's been around. He's done some big stuff. So <laughs> nothing's new to him. And then for, for um, Roya and I, uh, you know, this is definitely our uh, debut at Seattle Opera. And you all heard at first that she, the first time she went to a theater was for the showing of her movie and the first time she's going to opera and seeing a full opera is her own opera. So this is this is really truly uh, exciting and inspiring. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope you enjoy tomorrow. Um, so Vishwa, tell us, like you've been around the block a few times, you've been here, you've been there. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background and then Hopefully, you can tell us a little bit about, um, you know, do you have a passion for working in contemporary operas, or do you p prefer the traditional stuff? So, so sprinkle that in there too. So, I think uh, my manager and I were talking about this at lunch today. I think it might be my tenth or twelfth world premiere opera to conduct. I'm not sure. It's. Steve Osgood and I are trying to keep a tally to see who wins this one. Um, but, um, I, you know, I actually started and was trained as an orchestra conductor, which is what I really love as well. I love conducting orchestras. Um, I mean, I love Mozart. You know, that's really what got me into music. Mozart, Stravinsky, Beethoven, Brahms is kind of where I really wanted to start. Um, and then, you know, I had finished my time with Mazur in Paris and was trying to figure out what to do. And he looked at me and he said, Vishal, you should conduct opera. And I didn't know why he meant that. Um, and then when you really look at it, you begin to realize whether it was Toscanini, whether it was Kurt Mazur, whether it was Carlos Kleiber, or Claudio Obato, all the great conductors started in the pit. And I can tell you after now, wow, 17 years of conducting opera, I get it. It's one of the most difficult, rewarding, collaborative, mind-numbing, um, art forms known to man. I mean, it is the confluence of every art, right? You have, you have literature, writing, you have the creation of music, 
you have direction, you have art from like painting the set to architecture of the set to every single art form that we conceive of as humanity comes together in opera, right? And so when the curtain goes up, it's you know me and the stage manager calling the show basically. Um, it's one of the few art forms that is so technically difficult to act because the performers don't control their own timing. They negotiate their timing with the music and with the guy waving the stick and their colleagues on stage. And, you know, so to act under those circumstances while singing unamplified is a high wire act, right? So this is one of the, this is like the Mount Everest of art forms. Um, and then when you can conduct it, you go back to an orchestra and you're like, where, where is everything else? It's just you guys? Like, you know? So that's kind of how I got into it. But when I came back, I couldn't get a gig in opera because I'm not a pianist. So I decided to start my own opera company. Um, and we focused on contemporary chamber opera because I feel like we as musicians, even if as much as I would love to conduct a Brahms symphony tomorrow, have a duty to keep our art form alive. Right, and as a minority in this art form, I think it's also important to give avenues for a contemporary voice for people, right? Composers like Sheila should have the ability to create a voice for our time. You know, performers who are not white should have the ability to sing opera for our time. And so, Opera Vista was born, and we had a ridiculous little chamber opera competition that was like Opera Idol, where we would see parts of operas and the audience would pick which opera we produced. You know, and so that kind of got me into contemporary opera and then um, it became a passion and somehow it's become a specialty. Um, and when Christina called me to do this, because she only calls me for contemporary opera. <laughs> subtle hint. Um, it, it was an honor. are you out there to defend yourself? <laughs> Yes, she's a I have a track record to prove I'm right. <laughs> but, but it was an honor, right? Because as a South Asian, you know, I helped, I helped form an orchestra in India of musicians from Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Nepal, right? The old Sark countries, the, you know, what is South Asia? And to have musicians from the Youth Orchestra of Afghanistan playing with Oxford-educated lawyers from Sri Lanka who studied bassoon in Oxford when they were studying law. You know, it was the most ridiculous orchestra known to man, but it was amazing, right? And everyone was trying to figure out who the Pakistanis were. You know, because we don't think of the social dynamics if you grow up here, but South Asia has so, many, so much in the way of social dynamics. And to be able to do something that, for me, is not tokenism, I mean, what you will hear in the music is truly a synthesis of, it's a Western piece with incredible Hindustani elements, but it's not tokenism. It's done in a very, very honest voice. It does not feel like minority misery porn opera, which we seem to get a lot of. Well, well done, Sheila. You wanted to make a comment. Thank you so much, Vishwa, yeah, for that I, I, background. I, thank you, Vishwa. Um, I, and I, I think Viz, you're going to hear tomorrow night, Vizwa is just doing an amazing job with this music, and I'm thrilled that he's conducting it. And I wanted to say with, with Roya, when I first saw her work, uh, Christina and Aaron said, look at this lady's um, movie. And they sent me a link. and. And I thought, but she doesn't know a thing about opera. My God, she doesn't know anything about opera. How could somebody who knows nothing about opera direct an opera? <clears throat> I, I watched the movie with my husband twice. And I said, this is an artist. This is a artist with a real eye and a real vision. And, and actually, the film Letter to the President has many aspects of A Thousand Splendid Sons in it. The, the end of her opera, the end of her, her film, which kind of was like an opera, the end of her film, is similar to the end of our opera. And I said, it's much better to take a person who has a clear vision and bring them into a completely different art form and let them work their magic. Of course, that means that the, that the opera company bringing them in has to give her a, a big support system. But better to bring a person with a real vision in to do this than to take somebody who's you know just a kind of 
more ordinary opera conductor, who, uh, opera com director who will fall back on the cliches of what opera is. The best thing is she doesn't know those cliches, so she's not going to do them. And so that was really exciting, and, <clears throat> and she has done a fantastic job. It's thrilling. I actually remember uh, when Sheila called me, like uh, maybe a few days after she watched the film, she's like, do you know Roya Sadat? I'm like, yes, she's very famous in our country. <laughs> and then she's like, uh, I think they're gonna hire her as our director. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. And then she's like, you have to watch her movie. Here's the password. Don't tell her I gave you the password to our <laughs> Vimeo show movie. And, and I had the pleasure of uh, watching her film too and, and was, uh, actually, my mom was a big uh, uh, fan of Roya and introduced me to her in the sense, like through Afghan, Afghan TV. So um, I, I'm so happy to be here and working alongside her. Um, so we're going to go a little bit into process. You know, we all now have gotten over like our initial um, interaction with the book and such. Uh, so Stephen, um, tell us a little bit about what it's like to write a libretto as opposed to a play. And how did you balance Hollett's story and honor it in this libretto? Right, well I've never written a play, so, um, <laughs> but, but I've taught them and I've read them and I've seen them. But I would say that the first thing is to just look at the source material, at the primary source. Clearly, this is a novel that could be adapted for television series. It could be adapted for film. It was adapted for a play. But this is opera, and we know that in opera, we're telling the story through music. We're telling it through the human voice. We're telling it because of the emotions that are so heightened or so exalted. So finding those moments in this story, which were palpable, is what Sheila, Sheila, you know, what she knew when she when she listened to it and then read it again. So my my job was essentially to distill the novel um, and find a way to tell the story that used both concision and structure, not only for the composer because the composer needs words that are concise but structured, but also for the audience so that it's comprehensible. And in contemporary opera, I really believe that we can tell stories that are enlightening and edifying, but also entertaining. And while this is a very serious subject, we still have a, a responsibility to provide some form of entertainment for our audience. Um, and so we looked for places where we could lighten up the intensity of the action. To do that, I accessed my musical theater experience. And in doing that, I found a number of moments that I think will, and hopefully, will read as, as light and, and relief, and relief from the intensity. Not to derail it at all, but to do so. Um, in terms of the text, it is so rich but, and, and the book is written, so obviously many have, written, have read the book. So you know it's written in four parts. It's in the third person. And part one is Mariam's story. Part two is Lila's story. Part three, they're in the house together. And there's alternating stories from their perspectives. And sometimes they overlap and sometimes they don't. The fourth is a coda. We don't deal with the fourth part at all. We don't deal with it because at the end of part three, and this is a spoiler, but I'm sure you know it's a spoiler, our heroine dies. And in opera, when the heroine is dead, the opera is over. So that's just the way it has to be. We're not interested in reinventing any, anything here at all. So whether she jumps off the Castel Sant'Angelo, you know, or is you know, stabbed to death, whatever, we need to end right there. And so we knew that we needed to define that. By the way, I will say that what Roya has done with the libretto in general is she has put her entire artistic vision on it, including an ending that is mind-blowing, an absolute mind-blowing ending 
Um, and, and I'm so excited and eager for all audience members to experience the final moments of this opera. Um, but so Khaled's dialogue became essentially the root of most of the recitative, and the inner thoughts of the characters became what I would say were the moments for the arias that we defined. So Sheila and I worked diligently to figure out what are the aria moments? What are the moments? And, and I came prepared. If I could do this now, I went over with Alex. Yeah, of So course. I figured um, I would like to just read a very short excerpt from one of the sections of the, of the novel and explain how we crafted the, um, the aria, certainly from the words, and then, of course, through Sheila's just sublime music. Um, so to do that, I need to take these glasses off. And um, so this is an aria about surviving in an unforgiving situation. It happens in Act One, Scene Four. Um, Mariam lay on the couch, hands tucked between her knees, watched the whirlpool of snow spinning outside the window. She remembered Nana saying once that each snowflake was a sigh heaved by an aggrieved woman somewhere that all the sighs drifted up to the sky, gathered into clouds, then broke into tiny pieces. A reminder of how people like us suffer, she'd said. How quietly we endure all that falls upon us. Stephen, underline how quietly we endure all that falls upon us, because that is the root, that is the hook of your aria. And so this is the draft that I gave to Sheila an A section, how quietly we endure all that falls upon us like snow that drops silently on the people below. How quietly we endure, we endure. Section B, exposition. He was not unkind at first when the promise of a child was so close, but I could not give him what he wanted. I could not give him a child. I could not give him a son. Allah, give me a child, someone to love, someone to love me. How quietly we endure all that falls upon us like snow that drops silently on the people below. Each snowflake is a sigh, a sigh heaved by a sad woman. And I use the word um, sad and not aggrieved because that's a hard word to sing. A grief is a hard word. But sad is easier to sing. And also, too, when I first gave Sheila the draft, I don't think I had Allah give me a child. But Sheila, by then, had started to compose. And so our method of, of working is to go back and forth. I mean, a libretto is fungible. It needs to be flexible. You just can't give somebody the text and just say, here, set this. I mean, I guess maybe if you're Walt Whitman, but um, <laughs> not if you're Steve Gonzagos. Um, <laughs> And so we went back and forth, and she had already written the leitmotif for Mariam's prayer, Allah, Allah, give me strength, give me courage. And so I knew that we needed to include that back in there. And it also has a lot of repetition, which again is very important um, in, in opera and in aria. So anyway, that's just a little window into some of the process of creating this one aria. We call it the snowflake, or the snowflake aria, and we hope that it will be sung all over the world by Sopranos. <laughs> it's a beautiful aria. Thank you so much You're for welcome, sharing that background. Wow, that's uh, very insightful for all of us. Um, so in the process, um, we now heard about how the libretto was created. Uh, Sheila, tell us a little bit about you studying Hindustani music and what your journey was like um, in the process of learning that, and, and then how did you integrate the principle of Hindustani music into the music that we will all be hearing? Well, when I went to, to uh, India to study Hindustani music, I had no idea what would happen, uh, how I would, how, what I would learn, if, how I would be influenced, and I remember saying to my family, because at the time I took my then 14-year-old son and my husband with me, and 
uh, I had wanted to go for, for like 11 months, and they said six. I said, okay, deal. And so we all went. And uh, it's a very intense experience. You go every day to the teacher, and you spend a couple of hours in, the, in a studio environment where the teacher is uh, in the head of the class, as it were, and the students sit around. Everybody sits on the floor. The American lady was given a chair because sitting on the floor was just a little too hard for me. And um, they were all the age of my graduate students. And so I bonded immediately with them because I got to be like a student again. And being a student again after having been a professor for some 35 years was absolutely, totally thrilling. And I, I knew how to be a good student because I'd been a teacher for all those years. And I also completely surrendered. The whole time in India, I was only a sponge taking in whatever I could learn. There was no composing, there was no thinking of anything beyond what I was doing, which was get ready for every lesson the day before. And in Hindustani music, it's, it's taught uh, orally. You, the teacher sings, the student re responds, and basically sings the same thing. They're learning the kernels of how ragas work and how rhythmic patterns work. And there's no, no, there's no notation. They say they have notation, but by our standards, it's not notation. And, uh, and they have memories that the teacher can sing long phrases, and they can just repeat them. It's, boggles the mind. I know they practice for hours and hours and hours to be able to do that, and they develop those skills. Well, I didn't have that kind of a memory, so, but I, what I did have was an ability to notate and a shorthand, and so I would, uh, everybody, everybody, including all the, the Indian students, they all recorded every lesson the teacher gave, and I would record mine also, go home, transcribe it, come back, and I could sing it the next day. And he was amazed that I could do that because I had my special tool, which was this notation. So um, it, it, Hindustani music in, it influenced me in so many ways. I think it, one of the big things about Hindustani music is it, it always occurs over a drone. We would, might call that our do, or our, they call it the saw, the, the root tone. And the harmonic rhythm flows much more slowly than anything in Western music. And I really, really gave me an, another angle into slowing things down, and, and, there, and I fell in love with the sound of the drone. Um, it's, it's, they, they pluck an instrument called the tampora, and you basically hear the, the fundamental tone, but they say that all of the harmonics, they tune it to the, they usually tune a first and a, another degree, may be the fifth degree, may not be the fifth degree, depending on what the raga is, but they say all the overtones of the, of the raga are in this, drone, and I would sit for hours listening to the drone, which is always going, even when the teacher's talking and people are having tea, the drone is going. And, and I said, how could I orchestrate this? How could I make this sound through the whole orchestra? So the, the, the opera opens with one of these drones, and it's, um, you'll, you'll hear that. I mean, I, I could never have envisioned that kind of a sound if I hadn't been sitting for hours listening to these drones. And um, of course, I, I, I was most familiar with two instruments, because we had them in our class. We had a Bonsuri player that came daily to the class, and we had uh, tablet. And so and Bonsuri is a Bonsuri is a bamboo flute, a very old instrument. It is, it's, 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 it's all over South Asia, and certainly in Afghanistan, and, and India, everywhere. And tabla and the is tabla a percussion. Are the Indian drums, and they're, they're, they're ubiquitous all over South Asia. And so I, I knew a little bit about them. I studied a little bit, so I understood the rhythmic patterns. And I said, I'm going to incorporate these two instruments into the orchestra. And, um, uh, and I, our, our, our Hindu Sign musicians, which are, I think they're somewhere in the hall tonight. Um, Deep Singh and Steve Gorn, both of them, I've spent hours and hours and hours, and they're gonna, they, they know what I mean, to make this somehow tailored A to their voices and their instruments, but also to figure out how to bring those instruments to work inside of the orchestra. And I think um, it's gonna be very ex you know, exciting for the, for the audience, I hope, we hope, to hear this, this, this mixture that's going on. Well, as, as someone who's used to hearing tabla a lot in, in music, um, 
I love hearing it. I love hearing the tabla and the bansuri. It really feels at home, and it really feels like it transports me to Afghanistan. So I hope it does the same for all of you. Um, is it okay if I ask Sheila a question? I'm uh, sorry, uh, Roya, a question? Or yeah, yeah, did you no, want to elaborate no, no, more? No, 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 go. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Roya John, Shema Walin Dafaki Kasar Hondin, um, Wa by Bafikra Ziki to direct me, can in Chichi Zara that Borish Fakirkadi Nawal and Ole Sat Boot design Kasaik by the Mehanan, uh, Kudam Chiza Walin Chizi Bui Bafakar Tarahmad. Um, the question is, how did you see the story and what were some of the key elements you wanted to bring out in the directing? What were some things that you thought about the most, you know, sad costumes, um, singers, uh, lighting, what were the elements that rose to your thoughts at first? Uh, honestly, we, when I start to, like, thinking the way what exactly um, I want to do for the first structure for, for you, you select like. Then I just thinking with this beautiful music and uh, with opera stage. Um, if I go um, like more, uh, not in realistic the, the structure, more with um, surreal and modern style and and like. Like you fly with, with your dream, with the characters, with the, their life. With, um, um, and then you have more open hand to, to use uh, for, from each moment uh, many symbol or something. Uh, and also, I just thinking how we can, um, we can have some like imagination from from Afghanistan, from that land, because we have many uh, historical, uh, of course, Afghanistan is beautiful, that, that we, we never seen the news, we never seen in this uh, big uh, platform media in, in West. Um, I try and I talk with uh, our uh, set designer that how we can, like, if we don't have a specific moment in our opera, how we can connect the, the real location with some elements, like we start with a small kolbe, and then we have some image from a historical location like Menoret and Herat, who have um, more than 1,100 um, uh, uh, history. And uh, uh, in many, like, uh, for for set, de set designing, uh, special for the um, like use from uh, more projection, not the reality. So totally, the, the situation for for the structure of this opera was for me different. I, I was a starting like you start for shooting a script. I just start for how we go scene by scene for this structure and we, what we want. In terms of the costume, also many things was for me like a symbol. How we can play like we came from. 1970, that, that time the women was free, Afghanistan, uh, at least they, they choose what they want to wear, like totally was different. How we, I can play with, with this um, historical change for the women. Um, but when I came to uh, Seattle, just the first day, uh, be, um, I think it was about five minutes or 10 minutes before I entered to this room. I think this room was, Christina, remember? Yes, this room was, no? Mm -hmm. uh, um, I wasn't behind of this uh, first door, and uh, I received a message from my sister, from Alka. Uh, she write for me, she just sent one video and then write to me that Roya uh, um, uh, Taliban, they took her out. And uh, they came there around of Kabul. So this is you in know, 2021, it, in 2020, yeah, two yeah. years ago. Yes. Mm -hmm. August 21. Yes. August 21. Yeah. Yes. Um, so b because that moment was really unbelievable for me, when re really the, cannot even 
thinking that the Taliban will come back, even they came back to be a part of government. The people doesn't accept them to come and join the Shia government or something. But like you go in the shock, and I two, three times I try to open the door, but I cannot with many, like, like you lose yourself. And with many like happiness moment, many excited for this opera, and this suddenly changed for me that I just thinking this is now like, like only a artwork for me. This is a kind of responsibility right now. Um, and then it's have many effects for the work also. Then I decided to go more for realistic. Like we feeling that this situation, we understand them better. We like, like we we drawing them, we walking with them from 1917 until 2001 when the first time Taliban came and took the country. And also have like, um, now the, the real power um, resistance in front of Taliban, they are women. And uh, the women who wasn't a part of any party, politics party, terrible politics party in Afghanistan, they're, they're they're free women. They are uh, women who are talking about their rights. They're, they're talking about, about their basic rights. This is the reality of color, the reality of life in Afghanistan right now. That it's half, it's like, like I'm happy to with this stage, in this um, critical moment for Afghanistan that we can talk about that. And you can see in the opera also that the only color, the beauty color, the beauty, uh, this is coming from women. Even when the last moment we lose Mariam, that she's she's for her life. The people behind of her, around of her, they lose. They they lose everything. So, um, in terms of the work, uh, last year uh, it's have many effect for for this opera for me. And each moment, like um, um, of course, I was very busy uh, with my movies and with opera. Like sometimes you even didn't find time to crying for yourself. Um, I don't know tomorrow what will happen. But uh, um, I think this, this opera is first time, like this for me, it's a kind of between like the story came from Afghanistan. This is uh, more like the heart connection, the humanity connection. We had always, we was connected with politics. Uh, we was connected with agreement with the Taliban that what what bring them for the Afghan people this agreement this situation coming from politics But this is the first time we have our heart connection our humanity connection. We talk about our culture We talk about our beauty in Afghanistan. We talk about love I, During the rehearsal when I work with our, our cast for we had very good beautiful scene to love scene long good scene <laughs> and then for for the mise en scene and composition, I, I, I talk with them. You try this all scene that finally one kiss happening. <laughs> you can <laughs> you can have one kiss from each other. The people who are in love. That this is the the kind of reality of women in Afghanistan. That uh, like how she's scared. How they are like, you know, with many um, many many things who coming from society from the. I don't know from the family, and also for for the um, violence inside of this history. That talking about uh, family violence, um, starting from family, and then we see that during the Taliban, uh, we have our uh, our narrative for the for the staging. Of course, for the music first, that's very power. Um, like this way, man is. Uh, their personality and characters, they're active, they're stand for each moment. Um, like some things when you, when you want, decided to stand in front of this violence. This is sometimes coming that you get education or you learn from society or, but we, all, we always forget that this is some things to like born with you and coming with you. That this is always I thinking, this is coming with Afghan women, that they're always the, the strong 
uh, during all this period of war in Afghanistan, and unfortunately, and they were the first victims, and they were the first hero who stand in front of all this violence. Well, and also it's so um, apropos that we have an incredibly strong Afghan woman who's directing this story and really bringing the essence of um, what has happened to Afghan women, both in the achievements as well as setbacks um, through the story. So uh, I'm really excited for all of you to experience this and see the story through uh, Roya's eyes. Um, so Vishwa, um, I mean, I'm not a musical expert at all, uh, but from what I gather, this is a really difficult score. Um, what has been some of the biggest challenges in working on this music, and what is it like to work with a living composer? <laughs> I'll answer the first part. Um, you know, anytime you do a new work, it's, it, your job as a conductor is to try and figure out how to put the singers in the best position to create their characters and the most beautiful moments, right? And you do that with 55 people in the pit, all playing musical instruments, all trying to do what's written on the page. But also understanding, and I think this is the fascinating thing about moving from orchestras and getting into opera, that theatrical structure is really important, and it takes place over three hours, right? Um, so it's hard, it, that's the hardest thing with the new work is to figure out where those beats are. You know, when does it need to move a little bit? You know, what does a singer need in order to feel comfortable rushing into a room with a suitcase and start singing? You know, those are parts of it while also keeping the architecture of the piece, the composer's requirements on the page, the violins playing the right notes. You know, all of that is part of the job. Um, and so the interesting thing about being in the room when you're putting a new piece together is you find that together. Um, it is the most collaborative art form, you know? I had an inter interpretation when I came in. Sheila knows her piece backwards and forwards. But in the end, this beautiful art is greater than the sum of every one of us, right? It is, it's hearing that a singer needs this to move because she has to be able to get through her passaggio to make this sound good. It's understanding that Deep is playing tabla but doesn't read music, so I have to be able to hear where the cycles are in order for us to land together, right? And so this piece has been that. It's, you know, it's bringing two different cultures together, and it's, it was great having Steve and Deep in the room because we, we play music. And everyone says music is a universal language, and I, I agree, but the language of music is not universal. Yes. So when you try and put, when you have those discussions, you know, Deep will look at me and goes, is this, is this that din din na din din na? I'm like, I, it's in 4-4. <laughs> you know, like, but, but this is that, th those are the moments that you have to try and, with a piece like this, kind of come up with a vocabulary for. Um, and I think that was the interesting thing. And in working with Sheila, that's the tough part and the great part, right? Because this has been her baby for 10 years, right? She can tell you every detail and she can hear the entirety of it and see it in her head. And she's been doing that for 10 years. But it's my job to get as close to that as possible with the performers we have whom she did not hear for 10 years, <laughs> right? And so that's the collaborative part that's been fun for the most part. <laughs> But also, also a challenge because there is no question that I, I, Steve's description of Sheila is the most apt I've ever heard. I have never seen anyone run around a room that much <laughs> in a rehearsal room and every detail of everything all the time. And it is amazing because it is such, it, it's so important to her and it should be because this is so important to all of us. But for those of us who've been in the room, you're kind of like, okay, but they kind of need the tempo to move. Otherwise, I can't sing the phrase, you know? And so those are the kinds of negotiations that you constantly have with the living composer, you know, because it can't be what's pristine on the page. It's, oh, right, this set piece has to turn, and it takes three minutes, and there's 12 seconds of music. <laughs> That's opera. Well, I'm, I think a lot of collaboration went into this um, 
world premiere and you all are really lucky here in Seattle that you have an opportunity to experience it. Um, so if you have some questions, please percolate those questions as much as you can. Um, we will get to your questions just in a few minutes, but I just have some um, last closing remark questions from each of our panelists. Uh, so for Sheila, could you give us a clue of some hidden gems that you have in the music that we should listen for while we are watching the opera? Well, I've already talked about the drones. I think those are really wonderful moments for me. There's a lot of fight music, and that's kind of like the complete and total opposite of the drones. And uh, so um, I think, I think the, the rhythms are, are, are complex in those sections and very exciting. So I hope you, in spite of the action, you got carried away into those moments. I think maybe some of the most happy music is the market music. You'll be able to smile and laugh there. And um, the, in the second uh, scene, there's the wife, I call it the wives music, and they're kind of, um, they're kind of bitchy women, right? And, and there's a lot of humor in that, and those, those, that section features the tabla, and you'll hear that very clearly. Uh, and then there are all those wonderful arias, you know, the, the snowflake one that he mentioned. There's the love music between Laila and Tarek, which dominates the fifth uh, scene of the first act. And once you hear that music, uh, you'll continue to hear those themes over and over again. And then uh, the, the opera is actually structured with two love musics. The first act has the love music of Laila and Tarek, and then um, the second act has the love music between Mariam and, and Laila, which is the aria is soon, very soon, and they they plan their escape and they and they declare their their bonding for one another, and so th th those two love musics dominate either side. You can listen for those. Well, I hope you're all going to be listening for that love music. Um, I love soon, very soon. So that's that's a uh, beautiful piece and our um, uh, female singers do an incredible job of it, right? I mean, they're just beautiful. Um, Stephen, um, the libretto is peppered with references to Persian poetic traditions. Could you tell us a little bit more about that and where we can experience it in the opera? Sure. So. Um so Khaled mentions in the, in the story of Lila, of Lila and Tarek, um, he references a poem, well he certainly references a story, it's a fable story told time and time again about a 7th century Persian poet whose name is, because I can't pronounce it, okay, um, and, and he wrote a poem Pies. called Lili and Majnun, and they're the Romeo and Juliet of the East, apparently. And he went mad because of his love. It's a typical story. Boy loves girl, girl loves boy, family hate each other. Well, so, except, except that this was written two centuries before Shakespeare. That's right, that's right, <laughs> so, that's right. So, that's so right. it's more that... That's right. It's more than that, that it came that from the... Romeo and Juliet is the... Is, is, is the Khaled. Lailan Majnun of the West. <laughs> right, so, so um, the tradition started in, on the Arabian Peninsula in the seventh century and it moved from the Arabian Peninsula into Iran and then from Iran and from Persia and from Persia it moved further, further east and, and eventually of course into Afghan. So Khaled calls it the, the, Rom the Romeo and Juliet of the East and it may have actually been the inspiration for, for other stories. But it's universal, that story of two families, you know, where one is opposed, there's an obstacle. And so um, the poem is actually not referenced in the novel but when I had to write a love, a love scene between a 14-year-old and a 16-year-old, they don't have the vocabulary to express quite yet what their love is. And so I talked to Sheila and I thought, you know what? 
they learned this poem at school, and why don't we use this poem as the basis for their declaration of love for each other? And so it, being able to interpolate that text of the poem into the libretto gave me and gave Sheila the opportunity to create a credible love scene between a 14-year-old and a 16-year-old where they couldn't express through their own, their own words because they don't quite have them yet, but they could say, oh yes, that poem says what I'd like to say to you. And that's the poem of Lily and Manjoon. I pass by these walls of Lily and I kiss them, these walls, these walls of Lily, if not for the It if not, not for the love of the one, one. But, but it is not for the love of these walls, but the one they're in. But the beautiful. one they're in. Yeah. Just beautiful. And the music is 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 rapturous. So yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So you all can listen very carefully there to pick that up. Um so Vishwa do you, did you have, prior to this um, um, opera, any connections with Afghanistan? And in reading this story, like what was your reaction and, and what did you think would be important for you to bring out? Um, so with, with my working with the South Asian Symphony Orchestra, I knew a number of musicians from Afghanistan. Um, Dr. Sarmast, who ran the National Conservatory of Afghanistan, had actually at one point invited me to come conduct the National Orchestra in Kabul. Um, and unfortunately, we had a president who sent a tweet and the Peace Summit was off and my concert was as well. Um, and so I wasn't able to go, but I, you know, we were, we were sitting next to each other when Roya received the videos of the Taliban retaking Afghanistan. And of course, I'm trying to figure out what happened to all those musicians that I knew from that orchestra. And so a lot of them luckily were airlifted out. There are three actually in conservatories in the United States right now. Um, they reestablished the National Conservatory of Afghanistan in Portugal. Um, so Portugal gave them asylum and Dr. Sarmast has started his school there. Um, but you know, musicians in Afghanistan are bearing their musical instruments. They can't play. Um, they're being beaten for making music. So when you consider that, and you consider the fact that we have the opportunity to make this amazing work of art, which is fundamentally based on music, um, it is an incredibly moving experience. Um, but what I love about it, and I think I keep saying this, it's not a social justice work in a social justice work in a social justice work. What it is is a beautiful love story about two women that also covers the fact that social justice is incredibly important so it is a story, it is a love story, it's, a beautiful, mu it's beautiful music, it's Puccini-esque, it's great singing, but at the heart of it, it is a story about a country that has faced so much and a people that are continuing to face so much. Um, so it works on multiple levels, and I think that's what really makes this such a spectacular, spectacular work. It's current, but it's also art. Um, so for me, that's been the honor. روی جان خودت چی میخوای که مردم درباره زنای افغانستان در امروز از یاپرا یک چیزی درباره زنای افغان یاد بگیرن و چی میخوای که کسایی که میرن دیدن از یاپرا بعد از یک برایان از یاپرا درباره افغانستان چی بکنن؟ uh, so the question is, um, what does this opera say, what, what does she want this opera to say about Afghan women? And what would she like you all to do after seeing this opera um, to um, uplift what the Afghan women are going through right now? Uh, honestly, it's always, difficult to talk about the message, like the people, uh, what will bring with themselves. Um, I think right now the important things that, as you see uh, 2001 after uh, 11 September happening, and then Afghanistan was like in the headline of news, 
and they're talking about women rights, about women human rights and international community, they came to Afghanistan. So women rights was important um, section who always talking about, uh, I don't know many, uh, Human Rights Commission, uh, UN, uh, Europe, uh, U international community, US. So uh, then after 2001 that we came in, like the people was tired for the civil war, for the Soviet war, and then uh, the people start like the change slowly bring out from the heart of society. Um, and lots of family, uh, they send their, um, uh, their daughter for, for uh, education. So many things in terms of culture, economic, politics was changed for women. And the people pay a lot, especially the women. And not only Afghans, Afghan people, um, uh, uh, the international community who come in Afghanistan, even US, they, they, they pay a lot. They, they lose their, their uh, many soldiers they was in Afghanistan. But, um, unfortunately, after 20 years, we are now go back in the same moment in 1995 that you see in the last scene in, in, in this opera. Like now, this history repeat for many women in Afghanistan, many Laila and Mariam, they're the same situation. So th th now this is like always when I'm working in a movie. Um, so I'm just thinking, okay, this is not easy that you say, I bring change with this artwork. I, want, I, I will change many things. But when the people uh, coming watch the movie, watch the opera, they thinking, they, they finally they came together with the same feeling, they understand many things that, that they never seen the news. So I think this time, I, I, I'm not looking only for, for as, it's an artwork, that this is just a work, that you can have your message. I'm really looking for, for a strong voice from the people who came and watched this opera. This is a time that we raise our voice. There is, when we're talking, there is the, like, terrible time for Afghan women and the, the Taliban, really, they are against women. This is against women is, have a big meaning, not only Afghan women. So. Um, I really hope the people, um, especially the media that we see, they have um, attention for this opera, for they they talking about um, Afghan women, about the people. And this, this situation really is different than 2001, than 1995 when the Taliban came in. Because now, as you see, we are really not in the headline of news. We are totally, with the people forget, and, and unfortunately. Those are very important, and, and I hope that um, this opera really affects you all um, in the same way that it does us every time we are in the rehearsal room or uh, watching the dress, dress rehearsal. Um, you know, there is a danger in representing traumatic stories about other cultures. Um, and that is one of the reasons that Seattle Opera has gathered a diverse creative team including three Afghan women to bring this opera to life. So uh, Roya, me, and then um, Rika, who is up there, Rika Sadat, she was very, she's up there. Um, she was the um, historical consultant on the, uh, on costume and, and such. So uh, there's been a real strong involvement of our community in this production. Uh, and we all believe it's really important to hear the story of A Thousand Splendid Sons uh, because it exposes important issues happening not only in Afghanistan and to Afghan women, but it's also happening to women here and around the world. Um, art draws us together to reflect on important and relevant issues that are plaguing our society. And in this case, it's patriarchy, uh, which affects us in many ways that we see and we don't see. It affects our values, our standards, our norms, and how we treat each other. Um, so we hope through Sheila's beautiful music, Stephen's poetic words, Roya's directing, and Vishwa's music director, um, uh, you all will be able to see the beauty of Afghanistan and the strength of the Afghan people. And, 
And before we open this up to questions and Alex gets down here, um, I want you to ponder a few questions yourself um, when you are seeing this opera. How do you balance the hope and despair within the story? Is patriarchy an Afghan or Muslim problem, or is it a global problem? And what's the call to action in the story? You know, as Roya says, we shouldn't forget what has happened to the Afghan women and Afghan people, and I hope that there will be some action that you all can take um, after this. On the Seattle Opera website, we have listed a variety of different ways that you can engage with Afghan community and Afghan people, um, whether it is locally or through um, international connections. So I hope you all take that opportunity. But I think we have a question up front right here. Thank you. This on? Yeah. I have a question for Wishwa. I was fortunate enough to be at the dress rehearsal last night, and the music is very unusual compared to what the normal stuff you find in 20th century opera. What well, my question goes to, how in the world does the conductor put something like that together? So you get the score with all the stuff on it. What do you do with it? Can you, can you think it out in your head just watching it? Or do you have to play things? Or how do you, int how do you integrate all the unusual sounds and all that? and make sense of it so you can actually get your orchestra to do what you want. <laughs> I don't know, I'll tell you on Monday. Um, <laughs> um, you know, when you, my, my first conducting teacher described score study as building the most perfect recording of how it can go in your head from the notes on the page. Um, and with this one, it was very much that because I didn't grow up with Hindustani music. Um, and there are a lot more half steps in different places where I would not expect them to be. So it was a lot more sitting at the piano, hammering out every line, singing through it, trying to figure out how it fit together, trying to hear it in the sonority of the instrument that's supposed to be playing it or the singer. Um, and you just slowly over months build the recording in your head um, with the metronome. Um, and so like you just literally sit there and you just keep singing through it and kind of layering each line on top of each other until you can kind of hear the whole thing. Um, I will say this with Sheila's music, one of the most intimidating things is when you open it, like I've done this for so long, and Phil Kelsey, who's the um, assistant conductor on staff here, he said the same thing to me. When you open the score, you know it's going to be good. It's, it's, you, you do this enough where it looks right on the page and everything looked right on the page when you opened it. So literally the first thought was don't screw this up. Um, because it does, it looks like it's supposed to be, it's gonna sound, you know? Um, and yeah, it's just that. It's building it all in your head and kind of singing through it, trying to figure out how it all pieces together, scene by scene. Okay. Uh, this is a question for Sheila. Could you talk about your um, relationship with Seattle Opera? How did it start and how did it evolve? And then also, at what point in that evolution did you add the various members of your creative team? I got the first part about Seattle Opera. How, how, how did your relationship with Seattle Opera start? And okay. then how did you build your creative team? Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, it started um, by my meeting Aiden Lang. Is Aiden here? Yes. Oh, hi, Aiden. <laughs> there he is. It uh, started by my meeting Aiden Lang in an elevator at an Opera America conference in San Francisco in uh, 2014. No, yes, 2014. And I had just received Opera Amer one of Opera America's first round of Tolman uh, discovery grants for women composers, which were grants um, created by the Tolan Foundation because women were, composers were highly underrepresented in the opera business. And part of this pri money was, it was they, they, they gave us a grant and I, which became, funded the first workshop, but they also f said, go to San Francisco and go schmooze up people in the opera business. So at this Opera America conference. So Aiden walked into the elevator and and I walked in after him, and I said, um, gee, you're the new general director of the Seattle Opera, and 
I told him a little bit about my project, and it just so happens that I was going to be in Seattle later in the summer, and he said, come see me, and we went out for coffee, and uh, he had done his homework, and he knew a little bit about the book, and the first question he asked me was, um, well, how are you going to deal with the violence? And I immediately, I said, and, I, and the honest answer was, I don't know, I haven't thought about it. <laughs> and then I called the Pacifico, I said, how are we dealing with the violence? <laughs> and and, and th I think the answer was, as little as possible to, but there has to be enough for us to understand that it is, ne it is necessary for Mariam to, to kill Rashid at the end. But we didn't want to dwell. We didn't want to live in the violence, especially the way it's delivered to people in Hollywood movies and that kind of thing. We did not want to do that. So we hope we dealt with it uh, as discreetly as possible. And that's how I. And so that was the beginning. And then what was the other part? How did you build your creative team? Well, Steve, of course, I was working with, and um, the the. Uh, I mean, you came in, and 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 Steve Gorn and, and Deep Scene came in, but the but the the uh, Roya and Vishwa was chosen by the Seattle Opera. Yeah, I, I was actually interviewing Holland for an event, and during that conversation, it came out that there was going to be an opera of A Thousand Splendid Sons, and I just finished working on the stage production. So I was like, opera, really? Let me look this up. So I wrote Sheila and said, are you working with a cultural consultant? And she literally responded in five minutes. And in a few days, the three of us had a um, conference call. And then I, became, I went to a workshop that they were doing for uh, Act Two. So that's how I got involved, yeah. And since then, I've been claiming that I've convinced Sheila to bring the top line, but she says, no, there was top line all along. Top I was line. like, well, I don't remember it. So it couldn't have been that much. And then well, we no, go back and forth the, like the that. The difference is it wasn't the same kind of player. Yes, exactly. So it's been, it, it really feels like um, a family because Sheila st stayed at my house a couple of times. I've stayed at her house. Roya stayed at Sheila's house in Stephen's house. I don't know. Vishwa, you have to stay at somebody's house. Uh, <laughs> I never get the invite. <laughs> so, so it really has been a wonderful experience in, in building this family together. Um, let's see, is there another question? Oh, I right think there. we have time for one last question. Okay. I didn't see where the hand was. Right there. Dennis is getting his steps in for the day. You're right. Um, I'm not sure who this question should be answered by, but given this is a new work, does it take extra rehearsal time by the orchestra to manage the piece as well? Because they don't know it. Well, maybe Vishwa can answer that. Yeah. Uh, we got really lucky because I will say that Seattle Opera has given us so much support for this. Um, we had four days of extra music rehearsals to, before we even began staging, which is incredibly rare. Um, and then on top of that, I think I had five orchestra reads. Uh, four? Five? But four? And one zits. It all runs together, I'm telling you. Like, I will sleep on Sunday night. Um, but usually I get three for an opera. So this was kind of, like three total, including the zits. So this was really kind of exciting to have enough time to actually read through the work. And, and it, it's a substantial work. So it, I will also say it was kind of fascinating to have musicians ask me, wait, is this the world premiere? I'm like, yes, yes, it is. They're like, good, because we don't know this. <laughs> but it came together quickly, so. Um, so the question was, you know, did they need more rehearsal time? But you had already done two or three workshops. So tell yeah. us a little bit about that. Well, we did how many workshops? Four. Yeah, okay. well, we including the uh, Upper America. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. yeah, well, sure. we, we've done. Okay, three. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, did, one. we did, um, <laughs> we first, the first workshop was at the uh, National Opera Center. The second one with the NEA, with, through, through AOP and the NEA was at the studios of Key West. Um, and then um, the orchestra reading. Now. And then we did the uh, New Works Forum at Trinity um, with a with the Novus Orchestra, 
and then we did Act Two in Hudson, New York. Right. And, and then again at National Opera Center, and that's when Aiden and his crew showed up yeah. and said, "Yeah." <laughs> That, yeah, that, that Aiden and Aaron came right. and, and, and Aaron decided well, that they yeah. were going to move forward. Yeah. Um, I will also say that the, the, we were very lucky. Uh, Mark Skorka here is here from Hop America. I don't know if he's here right now, but Mark, are you here? Mark Skorka is here. Well, he, oh, he left. left. All, right. All right. Well, well anyway, he, he, you know, he that, knows he's wonderful. That year we were very lucky that they... <laughs> I know. I saw him. Right. I saw him. He, he must have had dinner reservations. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... It, uh, that particular year that we were just having our, our, we were accepted for the, chosen to be, present something in the in New Works Forum, and that year they were having a full orchestral reading, which is a really big deal. So I got to try out some of the three passages in that open, the, the opening of the opera, I tried out right. there, um, and it worked there, but I rewrote it anyway, because that's what I do, but. Um, With tabla. Yeah. No. And with Mansouri. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we got to try everything out in the orchestra. Not the whole thing, but 20 minutes, 25 minutes in music. Uh, I believe that if there's one more question, we can take it. Otherwise, you can all go to dinner now. So um, are there any more? Well, if you, you don't have your tickets, please do buy them. We would love to see you there. Come see the show a couple of times. Uh, it's been an honor to uh, share these brilliant minds with you all uh, tonight. And um, please keep an eye out for the press. We're getting um, a lot of reception for this opera. I think the world is ready for it. They're ready to hear uh, Sheila's music. and. Um, and watch this show. So thank you so much for being with us tonight.